This is the Lean Construction Blogs Podcast, a podcast dedicated to stories, case studies, and lessons learned of applying lean construction from around the world. Join Dick Beyer as he interviews industry leaders, lean construction practitioners, and subject matter experts to help you improve the build environment in general and your design and construction projects in particular, advance your lean journey, and bring your continuous improvement efforts to the next level. Let's get started. Welcome, everybody, to the podcast. I'm Dick Beyer, and you are with the LeanConstructionBlog.com podcast. Uh, This is episode number 23, and it's the first one of the year in 2023. So it kind of coincidence? I don't know, perhaps. Uh, (laughs) But we're really fortunate today to have uh, a a good friend and and an unbelievable pioneer in all that we have uh, done in in the lean world. Um, let me introduce Iris Tomaline from the University of California at Berkeley. Hi, Iris. Hey, Dick. How are you? Good morning. I'm good. Thank you. I'm going to get you on the speak review here so that everybody can see you. Um, and so it, it, calling you a pioneer is almost too, uh, too tame of a word. I mean, you've been with Lean since the very beginning. and You're a founding member, I think, of IGLC and uh, founding member of really the uh, Lean Construction Institute. You're one of Todd Zabel's favorite people. So <laughs> that's always a, a great recommendation in my book. Um, and I think people are really interested in um, how you started in in this industry and how you got to Berkeley. And, and then there's a whole <laughs> number of people in our community that you have been the, the major influence for. So let's spend the next hour and chat about that. Does that sound good? Sounds perfect. Yes, I'm ready. All right. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> um, so uh, you're originally from Belgium, I think. Is that right? That is correct. Yes. Like my um, favorite detective, Hercule Poirot. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. It's interesting. So tell us um, a little bit about your early life and education. Uh, yeah, and I appreciate you. Uh, you gave me that question in an email because it gave me some time to reflect, actually, on something I hadn't thought about so much uh, in recent years. But I was born and raised in Brussels. Um, And then the next question people ask usually, so you speak French? The answer is no, I speak Flemish, Uh, but I am. (laughs) uh, Belgium is a very uh, interesting country, small country, 11 and a half million people, more or less uh, in this day and age. Um, We have three national languages and they are Flemish, French and German. So English is not one of them. (laughs) Um, And we are a very uh, very pluralistic country for for many, many, uh, many reasons. it would be a whole other podcast to just talk about all the, the intricate um, and bizarre uh, situations that we have in Belgium. But um, long story short, um, I, I was raised in a, a secular humanist family, and I'm still a secular humanist. Um, the, 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 main, um, the main upbringing that I had at the university level, <clears throat> should rephrase that, um, as a, as a secular humanist, um, I went to the Free University of Brussels, the Flemish speaking one, not the French speaking one. Um, and the Free University of Brussels um, has many people that very much like to quote uh, French philosopher um, Henri Poincaré. And I should read uh, his, his, um, his statement about, about thinking says, um, thinking must never submit itself neither to a dogma nor to a party, nor to a passion, nor to an interest, nor to a preconceived idea, nor to anything whatsoever, except to the facts themselves, because for it to submit to anything else would be the end of our existence. Wow, that's, uh, that's powerful <laughs> today, especially, isn't it? It is a very powerful statement and, um, of course, a little paradoxical in and of its own as well, which yeah. makes it even more interesting uh, to think about. But uh, I think that that um, that philosophy very much framed uh, my thinking. And I, I mention it because I think um, so much of the thinking resonates very well with with lean thinking and with the scientific approach that we have to to management of our project production systems today. So what was there about um, growing up in Brussels that's influenced you? You know, we talk about heuristic biases and things that people grow up with and they, they look left and they look right and they, and they see different things. Any, 
any influence from being Belgium and then teaching in the States and working, you've worked all over the world. So you, you're not limited to, you know, one, one continent for sure. Um, yeah, I think the main thing is Belgium is a very eclectic country, many people from many different reasons, right, of course, uh, from many different regions in part because it's the, the heart of the European community, um, and in part because it's a very small country and in and of its own it actually does not have much power and so it has to form coalitions with, with other countries and, and, uh, and uh, yeah, gain, gain strength by, by, by unity. Perfect. Yeah, mm -hmm. and unity and collaboration. It it has yeah. been at the crossroads of so many, um, I mean, centuries <laughs> of European conflict have always ended up somehow going through or touching Belgium as they uh, as it sat there. So it's been a unique and important country. Yeah, it's been called the battlefield of Europe. Okay. <laughs> anyway, sadly enough. <laughs> Yeah, thank goodness um, you weren't there when those things, those terrible things were going on. I hope. Uh, so, how did you get into construction? What was the what what led you to that, or did you not really get into construction? You got into design or engineering or something um, not construction. So, when I went to um, the Free University of Brussels, I actually started. Um, it, I was the first cohort of students that um, entered into a program called architectural engineering. Uh, but it was very much housed in the in the College of Engineering and very much tied to the civil engineering department. So we got some courses in architecture, but I also got a, a very strong, um, more traditional civil engineering uh, background. Uh, it was part of a five-year civil engineering program. And at the end of my fourth year, I had the great um, fortune to be able to participate in an exchange program. There's a program called IST, the International Association for the Exchange of Students for Technical Experience. Um, it's a wonderful organization. The idea is the local university finds industry opportunities for students um, that would come from other places. And then the students from the university that finds these spots gets their students to participate in the program as well. Um, I applied um, to go to the United States at the time and was fortunate to get a position. I ended up spending a summer working for the Whites Company in Des Moines, Iowa. Wow. And the Whites, yeah, the Whites is a, you know, terrific, terrific company to work for. They were very welcoming and I learned, I feel like an infinite amount about, about mm -hmm. construction. I worked for a wonderful project manager who would basically let me tag along to everywhere he went. And then there were other student interns that I that I learned so much from. It was it was really a great experience, and that was what got me so interested in in construction as opposed to the more civil engineering design and the things or the architectural uh, design and the things. Um, so then the next year I applied uh, for scholarships, and I had the again, great fortune to get a scholarship of the Belgian American Educational Foundation, and that allowed me to um, to go to the United States for a master's degree program and. Um, I was lucky to be admitted to Stanford University and um, ended up doing a master's there and then um, in, in the construction engineering and management program. And while there, um, Professor Ray Levitt um, had just returned from a sabbatical um, looking at the use of artificial intelligence and expert systems in construction and he needed students to get launched on this research area and so he recruited me. <laughs> And then I ended up spending another four years uh, at Stanford University working uh, at this intersection of artificial intelligence and, and civil engineering construction project management, working on um, a, an artificial intelligence rule-based system to help with the layout of temporary facilities on construction sites. Wow, interesting. <laughs> so Greg Howell was a, a Stanford guy. Did you run into him there or did you run into him later? Yes, no, no, I, I ran into Greg. Greg would come by, he was very diligent. He would come by at very regular times, kind of check in what was to, to, to hear what was humming, you know, at Stanford, what, what the ideas were. And he was always very, um, very interesting to talk to as well. Yeah, and another person I ran into who was actually quite influential is Vic Sanvito, uh, now, of course, at Southland. Yeah. Uh, we, just, gonna... we just passed each other. He had just graduated uh, as, I, as I arrived. Yeah, I was just going to raise that because one of his uh, favorite photographs is when he's like 20 years old at Stanford and uh, 
Uh, Henry is there, and Greg is there, Henry and all of these folks yeah. are there. Yeah. So, um, uh, and and I, when you were talking about architectural engineering, uh, I thought of Victor right off the bat because he was uh -huh. uh, he had taught in that architecture and engineering school at Penn State, and it turned exactly. out Mark Concher and Bevan Mace and exactly. lots, of PhD, lots of PhDs. And much and like David your, Riley, that's right. Yeah, yeah and much like your uh, your journey, where you've turned out lots of these PhDs. So, did you end up getting your PhD at Stanford? I did. I got. Uh, well, I did first did my master's in construction engineering and management, and then as I was working on my PhD, I also got a master's in computer science and artificial intelligence. And then, oh wow! Uh, in '89, I graduated with a PhD in civil engineering. Did you ever run into Fernando? Uh... Fernando Flores. Flores. Not not at the time, but he lives in Berkeley, and I have met him here, of course, in oh, more okay. recent years. Oh, yeah. interesting, because because he had when when he came back from Chile. I mean, he's he's known in our in our community as the you know founder of the action language, or certainly some you mm -hmm. know large part of it. But it, a, a large part of his study was around computers and artificial intelligence and things like that, wasn't it? That is right. That is right. With uh, with Terry Winograd in computer science. That is right. Yeah, he, his thesis was on how work gets done in the office. It's actually quite interesting. Thesis yeah. yeah. Wow. So but he worked let, here at UC Berkeley with with the philosophy professor as well. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Um, so after Stanford, did you uh, go out into industry or did you end up at Berkeley right away? Uh, no, I actually was an, became an assistant professor at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor in their construction oh, wow. engineering and management program. And, that's, a, uh, that's a beautiful place. It's a great place. <laughs> it's, a, <laughs> it's a very nice place. <laughs> and uh, this is a little bit of an aside, but I could say my my older son now is a master's student at the University of Michigan in robotics. So it's kind of funny how you know things. Oh yeah. Come around. <laughs> well, that's fantastic. Yeah, there's so many coincidences in the world. As a matter of fact. I think I first met you in a white corporate boardroom in Denver at an LCI board meeting. Um, so the whites connection was good. <laughs> it's funny <laughs> that you got there. Uh, all right, so you're at the University of Michigan. You're in a beautiful place in the Midwest, probably felt very great, much like home. Great, but great university, a, a, a vibrant place, both culturally as well as academically, a really, a really, really superb place. Um, and and I had a great um, great group of colleagues um, to to support the construction engineering and management program as well. So it it was really a good place to be. Um, my work there, though, my research there, kind of transitioned from looking at site layout um, and how to to solve that problem to kind of the more fundamental questions, as in um, you know how how do we know how much material we really need on a construction site and you know, and when when do we want it to be there? Um, so I kind of transitioned from the layout problem more into the materials management problem, and then later on more into the supply chain management problem, so the broader systems view on, on what needed to be done. So it was um, it, it was an interesting time to be posing these questions. Um, because even during my PhD dissertation research work, I was I was trying to understand how people do site layout, and it turns out there are very few academic publications that talk about site layout. The project management literature very largely ignores the problem of space planning. In fact, it's not it's not mentioned as one of the five resources, you know, materials, manpower, machines, time, and money. Space is usually left out. Yeah, it's, it's funny because it's it's, yeah. it's 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 obviously quintessentially important uh, where yes. you put the building uh, <laughs> because it has I mean it has ramifications on the size of the building, how the building operates, all, all the rest of that stuff. Especially, yeah, so it's, go, go ahead. ahead. So I, I was going to say, especially you know, at the at the project management level, you can pretend that it doesn't exist, but of course, when at the at the production level, as we say it, at the you know, where the boots meet the ground, space is, is super important. Yeah, no, absolutely. Especially since we don't know an, all, an awful lot about what's happening under the ground when we <laughs> run into on a regular basis. It's, uh, and in uh, in the su sustainability conversation these days, it's, you know, how you how you face the building and, you know, what's on the north side, what's on the south yeah. side. All of that's really, really important yeah. um, to what we're doing. So that, that's cool. And and you, um, I mean, what, what sounded 
like uh, probably at the time somewhat arcane uh, supply chain and things like that is super important these days as well. I'm seeing people on construction projects who who think that they they actually need a logistics strategy mm -hmm. and almost a logistician to coordinate how they get things in a in a very uncertain market where they put them how they get them to the site you know uh, all is risk mitigation for and now we have of course wonderful tools to help with that as well right building information modeling all the 3d representations are, are didn't exist you know or barely barely existed in the early 1990s and nowadays they're they're easy to come by and easy to use and they become increasingly powerful. So it's it's uh, it's very nice to see how the technology is really helping us do our jobs better. Yeah, I think that uh, the one of the things I see, especially in Canada, is how underused building modeling and information modeling is because it seems so powerful to me. And it seems like it's where everything should start. Everything should be built from that premise. And yet in, in Canada, we see a lot of BIM being take it out somewhere and turned into 2D drawings so that people could build mm -hmm. from 2D drawings. And it's like, whoa, we need to get, we need to get fired up up here. So, so you're at uh, the University of Michigan. And then from there, did you go to Berkeley or did you have a transitory stop in between? Yes. Yeah, so um, as an academic, we are allowed to go on sabbaticals. And so as, as um, part of my sort of realization that so little had been really written about materials management and site layout. Um, I, I found at the time the best company um, to, to, to work with to learn about materials management. So the Construction Industry Institute had done a report several years before uh, with um, kind of highlighting the, the computer-based materials management system of, uh, of HB Zachary. And um, I thought if I'm going to learn about materials management, I really need to learn about how that system works, what it does and doesn't do. So I had I had the good fortune then to um, to reach out to HP Zachary and um, their manager of material management, Jim Goodwin, um, suggested that I come join him on a large project site, a billion dollar project site. In, uh, in beautiful Pasadena, Texas. This doesn't look like home. You know, hey, Dorothy, we're not in Brussels anymore, right? <laughs> it's, the, it's the American experience. You gotta go. It is for sure. The interesting work is happening. <laughs> um, so, um, and so, you know, it was it was a one of these EPC type contracts where, um, you know, the engineering firm had done a lot of engineering work and a lot of procurement of all the big materials, the, 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 the more uh, engineer to order materials. And then of course had put in estimates for all the commodity materials. And um, as, as Jim, as the contractor then was seconded um, to the construction site, of course, um, there's a lot of attention paid to all the engineer to order materials. And you just assume that you have enough of the commodities, but the commodities were estimates and, you know, estimates like plans or forecasts, forecasts are always wrong. Right. And so Jim ended up spending a lot of time just procuring stuff, procuring stuff, procuring stuff. So that was kind of a big eye opener for me that I realized it's like, well, why, why didn't get the numbers right? <laughs> why should we be doing all this so late? Um, the other thing that really surprised me at the time was um, just the whole practice of what's called trial allocation is, you know, the foreman would check in the computer system like the day before whether all the materials that they need for the crew would be available. And oftentimes there were shortages. And so there was some competition between crews as to who was actually gonna get the materials. And of course, that's not a great, um, a great, um, a great way of getting work done as, as, you, as, you, uh, as you need everything that you need. Um, <clears throat> so I, at the time, actually my interest, um, my interest was in the use of barcoding and, and laser-based positioning systems in site layout. So that's actually how I got there. And I did a study um, on, on laser-based systems and, and barcoding to, to try to improve the actual management of materials on site. It's materials that would be there sometimes three months, four months, five months uh, oh, long, man. which, you know, in, yeah, in, in Houston, you know, sunning in the beautiful <laughs> Houston sun is, uh, <laughs> is not the greatest. And of course, as happens then they get damaged, they get lost and so forth. Right. So 
Um, long story short, it was it was a great experience, um, but it, it I came back with with more questions, you know, than than I had um, going in. Although I, I learned a lot, um, and then um, as I went back, I should have mentioned um, I actually I did, this did not end up being a sabbatical. I actually uh, left the University of Michigan before uh, I could take my sabbatical, but I took a year off because I was so eager to go. You know, be out on a construction site and learn from the best. Yeah. Um, what was happening? So after that year, um, the reason why I left the University of Michigan is I had actually accepted a job at, at uh, UC Berkeley. So I joined the faculty at UC Berkeley in uh, 1996, and I had uh, lunch at mm -hmm. our favorite Japanese restaurants with Ben Ballard, who was a, a lecturer yeah. at the time, and I was um, commiserating, I guess, with Glenn about the state of practice about. So many materials being in inventory and laid on yards for so long and why should this be and why can't people get it right and glenn at that time introduced me to the last planner system and of yeah. course at that lunchtime kind of things clicked in my head right and so wow i was very fortunate that uh, that we had that lunch and i've been a collaborator with glenn ever since so, that's fantastic yeah it's it's always hard to know who's um who's driving the train, but it seems like you've always been a little more on the academic side and Glenn's been a little more on the, let's get this out in the field side. Is that that fair or is it mischaracterization? Well, I, I have maybe moved from academia a little bit more to the field. Glenn, of course, started in the field as, yeah. a, as a pipe fitter and foreman and then productivity improvement consultant. And he became more of an academic. In fact, he did his PhD in 2000. Um, in part to kind of formalize the, the thinking around the last planning system. So it's been it's been a very nice, um, you know, bringing together of ideas and testing the more theoretical ideas against practice. Yeah, well, it's certainly one of the strongest collaborations in in our community, and uh, we've all benefited from it. So, thank you for that. <laughs> so, so you were involved with that. So, so Glenn started talking about lean, I guess, at the same time that he was talking about the last planner system and. That or had you been involved in the lean movement before that? Yeah, that's a good question. So actually, I was not in the International Group for Lean Construction when it started in 1993. Mm. Um, although I kind of knew about it because I, I had heard some papers and, and met Laurie Koskela at the time, who of course was the driver. So Laurie Koskela, um, Glenn Ballard, Greg Howell, Luis Alarcon, there may have been other people there. I, I, I mean, obviously, I, I wasn't there in, the, in 1993 when the IGLC was founded. Uh, but what was interesting about the early 1990s is just that a number of people, including myself, sort of came to this um, understanding of industry where we, where we knew that the existing systems were not performing as we wanted them to. And unfortunately, today, that's still the case, right? Too many projects are late. Too many projects are over budget. Right. And so we were looking at other things. So as I already mentioned, Dick, um, on my end, uh, my my big kind of aha was it's like, well, people in project management talk about these five resources. They don't talk about space. If you don't even talk about space, how can you manage space? And if you don't manage space, you know, aren't we running into problems? And therefore, you know, what should we be doing to manage space, right? Uh, so Laurie Koskela, and, and sorry, let me do Glenn Ballard first. So Glenn Ballard sort of came to a similar realization, which is, you know, as, as a foreman, I want to do work, I want to do good work, but I'm basically impeded from doing good work because I don't get the right instructions, I don't get the right materials, I don't have the right place to work. Therefore, what can I do about it, right? And that's really what gave birth to the last planner system. Um, Laurie Koski, like came at it from more academic end, uh, but also very much with the systems, the larger systems view. So he looked at the different bodies of knowledge in the literature um, in, in uh, operations management, in project management, and, and, and he brought those together. And the, the prevailing um, perspective from a project management perspective, still today very much present in the Project Management Institute body of knowledge, is a transformation view, as in you have right. to transform inputs into outputs, and you should do that as well as you can. And if we do every task as well as we can, we assume that the project will be performed as well as we can. And the reality is, of course, that that is not true because the tasks are not, inter not, are not independent of one another, right? right. If, you, if you treat them as independent, 
you break dependencies and therefore the local optimization solutions are, are really not necessarily going together at a higher level. So Laurie brought together this transformation view perspective and said what we really need to view, need to add to it is a, is a flow view on production. And the flow view of production in the literature is captured by, by queuing theory, by, by, um, by what we do with simulation. And then on top of that, he also said, well, but what good is it to do transformation? What good is it to be good at doing transformation, doing it fast, if there is no customer who wants it, right? So the third right. perspective is the value perspective. So it's, you know, it's, and it's those different, you know, kind of um, incongruencies, I guess, <laughs> that we all, that we all realized that kind of brought us together and sort of said, well, we know things are missing. Let's go figure out together what we can do to fill in the missing pieces. And, you know, we're still working on that. They're still missing pieces, but I think we've come a long way. Yeah, no, for sure. And and you certainly have come a long way. I mean, I remember that very famous paper of Laurie's when he was talking about those things and he had gone back to Shrewhart and he'd gone back to all these, you know, production managers in the thirties and had said, you know, these guys were beginning to think about this in the right way. And then something, you know, got us off track. I remember another article that he had about, um, about really whether we should be calling this lean or not, whether there was a, whether there was a there there mm -hmm. about whether the value, the values that were, or the principles that were trying to be enunciated around what was a lean construction kind of conversation were very loose for Womack and Jones. And he, he was, uh, as the disciplined guy that he is, <laughs> skeptical about whether there were principles around it. Did you, did you ever struggle with that same kind of idea that calling this lean construction was maybe not the right thing to do? Yeah, the challenge with any word, of course, yeah. is that there are many interpretations for it. And um, unfortunately, or, or fortunately, right, the, the value of words is that they're concise, but but there can be a lot of meaning given um, to any term. And, and I think the same has happened with Lean. I think Laurie, who's also one of my collaborators, I have the fortune to collaborate with, um, even, you know, as, as we speak, so to speak, <laughs> on Zoom meetings. Lots um, of smart people. <laughs> um, the, let me think here. I lost my train of thought. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Um, I threw off really the, the value of the word lean as a Yeah, the a, value a of the word lean. Yeah, so the, the problem with the value of the word lean is that it's it's only a single word. And of course, there's many meanings associated with it. And and you know, as anyone learns, you know, a new language, and as I mentioned, I, I speak several languages. Um, as anyone learns a new language, um, you always start with a very narrow understanding of the term and then later through you know reading more you really begin to understand nuances and distinctions between words and i think that's the challenge that we have with lean is that people who are new to it try to kind of box it into a specific understanding that they have at the time that they become familiar with the term and then they begin to see that there there are other aspects that would need to be addressed and then they say well but that's not lean whereas you know, in reality, you know, other people might think that it is lean. So right. anyway, this gets us into a sort of a, a discussion almost about religion, right? Is it is it this yeah. or is it that? And I, I try to shy away from it. So I, I, I try to be very agnostic about the use of the term. Uh, I'm happy to call it lean if you want to call it lean. And if you want to call it something else, I'm happy to call it something else as well. So this is this is part of your secular humanism. <laughs> let's let's not get trapped in some kind of uh, passionate uh, opinion <laughs> stake, right? Let's just go find out what the what the facts are, and let's see where the facts and the scientific method leads us. Exactly. So, <laughs> yeah. So that I mean, my own transition has been um, really moving away from the seven ways or the eight ways or whatever, and thinking of if you just think of everything as value, if 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 you're only focused on value. Waste kind of identifies itself and starts to kind of flake off like, uh, you know, hair on a dog in the in the springtime, um, <laughs> because it begins to open up that idea that uh, are we, you know, why are we paying for this and why are we paying for that and and is actually payment the value proposition that we're looking for? Um, so I've been digging deeper into the kind of, uh, you know, what is value as a uh, not only as a kind of secular humanistic concept, <laughs> um, but as as it applies to 
to all of the things that we do. And I think it's a, it's a really good conversation to have. Yep. So, um, so you 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 got to Berkeley and you were and you and Glenn began your really terrific. Uh, almost 20 year ride now, right? Or almost 30 year ride. Almost, yeah, almost 30 years. 25, Less, more than 25, yes. Yeah, fantastic. Um, and a lot of people came through Berkeley. A lot of people ended up at the University of California at Berkeley looking for uh, a deeper understanding of lean principles and, um, and looking to assist in the kind of research things that you guys were accumulating over time. And, and they are some of our most prolific practitioners <laughs> in our community. Um, mm -hmm. So it, it, the first question I have is, is do you feel kind of like the, the mother hen of that tribe or? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't feel like the mother hen of that tribe. <laughs> <laughs> These aren't your children out there uh, evangelizing for the, for the really, well, tell me how you feel about that. I mean, what, how did, how did the program that, that you and Glenn had um, obviously uh, has prospered under your tutelage, how did you begin to find folks who were coming to you for that kind of uh, deeper study? Yeah, at first, of course, the students that came to Berkeley just came to Berkeley. I mean, they didn't come necessarily for us. And I think that's probably still true today. That's a, significant, <laughs> I don't know. a significant part of the attraction is just to come to Berkeley. <laughs> um, Although nowadays we have more students who say I've read your papers and I'm interested in lean and then that's certainly very much appreciated. <laughs> but um, yeah, the, the early students I'm thinking like, you know, James Chu, um, you know, came to Berkeley because it was a good school to come to. Um, and, you know, we had the fortune uh, with James to work, I mean, not just close together with Glenn and learn about the implementation of the last planner system, but uh, we ended up uh, on construction sites, I vividly remember being on top of San Francisco airport boarding areas A and G uh, with Todd Zabel and his company at the time, Pacific Contracting, because right. Todd was doing amazing things and implementing last planning system in close collaboration with Glenn, um, you know, detailing the different plies of, um, of uh, roofing material and having very specific procedural descriptions on how the material would be put in place, which which at the time um, was was revolutionary, right? For as obvious as it is, it was quite revolutionary to spell out the work for the craft workers at that level. Uh, so that was that was very successful, and so we learned we learned a lot from being able to work closely with industry practitioners and and have really good conversations about how we can continue to improve work. So James Chu, of course, with, with Todd and started um, strategic project solutions. And the work that they had done got, got a lot of um, a lot of praise also internationally. And they ended up working on Hinto Terminal 5, um, implementing a really full-fledged web-based um, last planning system, and then moved on from there. So timing, of course, is super important. <laughs> yeah, location. no, of course. Yeah. And Todd <laughs> Todd speaks really uh, uh, really fondly of his time at Heathrow. Um, mm -hmm. because he said they, they were just learning so much every single day. They were just learning all kinds of things that it was a, it was the perfect laboratory for him. And, and Glenn was there as well, I know. And were you on Heathrow Terminal Live as well? I visited, but I was not involved. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So James Chu is, is one for sure. And he's uh, obviously, yeah. um, he's accelerated his learning year after year. And his uh, uh, SPS is, is doing some amazing things out there in the world. Exactly. Um, but you have you've had a bunch of others. Farouk Hamza, for instance, is a buddy of mine up here, uh -huh. and he's uh, and I think he's trying to turn the University of Alberta into <laughs> into the Berkeley of the North. Uh, <laughs> yes. Obviously, trying to go deep with those things, and uh, and a ton of people, Colin Milberg and Cynthia Zhao, and lots of lots of our friends. Um, so, uh, were were you there to just kind of help them? and guide their research into the PhD or had you developed a number of things that you were really interested in and they, they uh, these kids kept feeding in or uh, they weren't always kids, <laughs> um, kept coming <laughs> to you and saying, oh, what do you have for me? And you directed them in a certain <laughs> certain way or how did the how does the PhD program that is so famous in our community uh, get started? 
so research is always very opportunistic, right? So we, we have ideas, um, we talk to people, we read to get inspiration, but then a lot of, of, especially at the PhD research level, a lot of it has to do with what the student wants to do. And a lot of it has to do in the type of research that I do as to whether we can find industry collaborators um, to, because, you know, there's only so much work that we can do in computer-based simulation, for example, in virtual design and construction on our computers at the university, right. we have to go to the Gemma, right? We have to be able to, to hear firsthand what's happening on the ground and, and we have to work with people in industry and we've been very fortunate in Berkeley also to have a wonderful community of practice of lean practitioners who are very open um, to working on developing new ideas. Um, so, you know, different students come with different interests and I usually run a number of ideas um, by them. Um, they, they often come and they say, oh, I, I want to work on X, but that's because they've read a paper on X and they think that that's the topic to work on. But then we find out some people are more into computer programming. Other people really don't want to do any computer programming. <laughs> <laughs> some people are very uh, mathematical inclined, like to do simulation or building information modeling and, and other students just want to go out and, and talk to people and are maybe more theoretical in, in developing. Um, in developing models. So I've had the fortune of working with a wide variety of students, which is, I think, part of why um, there has been so much impact is because, you know, they have gone out and then worked in so many other different areas than I'm currently working on. Yeah, so they've worked, uh, they worked in consulting, they worked in actual construction and, and design firms, and, um, and many of them have gone on to academia as well to continue yeah, so that. You mentioned, um, yeah, so you mentioned, um, you know, Cynthia and Colin, obviously, who work as consultants, um, basically on the East Coast, um, a number of academics, Farouk being one of them, I'm thinking also of um, Thais Alves, of course, at San Diego yep. um, State, uh, Kristen Parrish at Arizona State, um, Zofia yep. Rutkowski at Texas A&M, yes. uh, and Hyun Woo Lee at the University of Washington, and then there's 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 so many more students. I mean, they're they've they've branched out, and they were and they they were brought to you from all over the world as well. It, it wasn't like they were just uh, you know Salt Lake City in Chicago. You've you've really touched international students. That's right. Yeah, I I, I didn't mention too many of them, but um, you know, Jan Elfing also is very much stood out. He was one of the early students who looked at supply chain management for electrical switchgear and then went back to Finland. And he's now one of the vice presidents um, within Skanska, Finland. Um, and he's he really was, you know, very uh, dedicated student. So he took so many of the lessons learned to Skanska and began to experiment in Skanska, Finska, Finland as to, oh, how do I do, how do I map out the supply chain for precast concrete elements? and um, how do I set up a consolidation center for construction work in Helsinki? I mean, he's run a number of experiments, some successful, some not successful, and, and has learned so much and has moved, you know, forward at such a speed. It's been really amazing. So you and, um, and Glenn set up the Project Production Systems Laboratory, P2SL, mm -hmm. um, at Berkeley. Was, was that an attempt or... <clears throat> Um, and I always mean that was an attempt to get industry involved as well in the kinds of things that you were doing and, and find placement for it. <laughs> experiments so, out there in the with industry. Is that a misconception? It, it, no, no, it, it, it's right. But let me take a step back to give you maybe a, a, a richer picture of the of the history. So, you know, Glenn and Laurie and, and Greg and others started the International Group for Lean Construction in 1993 because they realized that there were, you know, theoretical gaps in how we managed our project. And then in 1997, just after I had joined um, the faculty at UC Berkeley, uh, we realized that the number of these theoretical principles and methods really need to be um, disseminated to industry on a broader basis. And that's what causes to start the Dean Construction Institute. Um, and, and then several years later, Glenn and I realized that yes, the Dean Construction Institute you know, had a lot of work to do, was doing great work in getting ideas of the last planner system, for example, out to industry. 
but we ended up with many more questions than were being addressed. And um, we felt like there really needed to be a strong entity to do research, really focused on research and lean construction. And so in 2005, we started the Project Production Systems Laboratory um, with that in mind. It was started um, in part out of need um, from industry. So a little bit of history on, on California healthcare projects. We used to have an organization called the Office of Statewide Health Planning and Development, and it was created in California um, to make sure that the infrastructure available to provide healthcare would, um, would be available after a major earthquake. Um, right. Now, the, the requirements from OSHPOD um, really created a lot of havoc among owners of acute healthcare facilities because um, they were required to upgrade their facilities, not just to remain standing after an earthquake, but to remain fully functional after an earthquake. Right. And so in the early 2000s, more or less, um, the healthcare owners began to do some capacity planning as to you know, how many designers do we need to be able to design what's needed here and how many contractors do we need to be able to do that and they realized that there just wasn't enough capacity in the market to fulfill the requirements and so one of the owners specifically Sutter Health um, sort of said well we're we're an important player I think at the time they had six or eight billion dollars worth of work ahead of them they said we're an important player, but in fact, we're dwarfed by some other players in the industry. And there are many more players in the industry than just us. And there just isn't enough capacity. So what are we going to do to get the best designers, the best builders to work for us? And so they stuck their neck out. I think you know the story. They yeah. stuck their neck out and they said, well, let's, let's become the owner of choice. Let's figure out what we need to do to be the owner of choice. And that really engaged them in the, in the lean journey in you know, rewriting contracts to go from traditional contracts, transactional contracts to relational contracts, where LIFTIC of course was crucial in, in writing the integrated form of agreement, you know, and so on and so on. So, yeah. so, that's, so that's, what started, that's what started P2SL. So just to complete a thought, um, the, the challenge now was that the OSHPOD was kind of the regulatory agency, kind of the bottleneck between the completing the design and starting construction. And OSHPA would take a long time to do the review, uh, which, which really was a, a, a unique set of, um, imposed a unique set of requirements, system requirements, right? Because you had to make sure that the healthcare facility would perform as a whole. It wasn't just looking at specific, only specific parts. Right. Um, and what was happening is that because there was so much demand, you know, designers were submitting design documents for review and OSHPA would take a certain amount of time and then that certain amount of time began to increase. And as the amount of time for review began to increase, designers began to say, well, we need to get into the hopper sooner <laughs> so that we come out sooner. Well, right. that unfortunately was a fallacy because getting into the design hopper sooner basically meant that the design was less coordinated than it could have been. And because it was less coordinated, it meant that Oshpad had to spend more time reviewing. And unfortunately, then also realized sometimes after months of being in the hopper that a project had to be sent back for, for you know, redesign and, and refinement and then come back for a second cycle and a third cycle. And so basically the industry was spinning out of control. Right. Oshpad was taking longer and everybody realized this was a problem and, and nobody off their own could really do something about it. And so at the time, you know, Paul Reiser, Sutter and others um, talked to Glenn, talked to, to me about, you know, what can we do about it? And P2SL provided kind of a neutral ground um, for us to map out what it would take to deliver a hundred bed hospital for Oshpad as the first customer, not not just for construction. And because we were neutral ground as P2SL, we could actually invite Oshpal to come and join us in the value stream mapping exercise. And we were very fortunate at the time to have John Gillingerton and others um, within his organization come and be part of this kind of neutral mapping exercise to really look at how can we solve this industry problem. And that, that really was the launch of, um, of P2SL. Oh, wow. That's fantastic. Because I, <laughs> I worked at a number of hospitals in California with that had Osh, Oshpod constraints. 
And it wasn't just the, the design, it was the equipment. Like if you have an air handler, you had to send it to their shaker table and it had to withstand, a, you know, a Richter eight scale shaking <laughs> and still continue going. And uh, I know you had to have, you know, 30 days worth of water. And uh, these were enormous requirements. And people in, in Iowa would say, well, why does it cost a thousand dollars a square foot to build a hospital? And California and said, well, you know, they, they'd like the hospital to be standing and operating after a Northridge type earthquake, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which I think, I think Northridge sparked the Oshpod. Uh, the regulations. Kind of yeah. yeah, creating that office and, and having it, yeah. you know, not just standing, but operating. So, well, that's, that's cool. I didn't know that you guys had uh, actually facilitated some of that to, to move, to move that along because that was always a you know, it's, it's always a dollar figure. And the question is, uh, all delays cost money, as we know, especially in the in the mm -hmm. lead world, all time costs mm -hmm. money. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we still face that in administrative reviews for all kinds of things. And uh, that's probably something we should turn our attention to at some point. <laughs> It's a nice thing, right? My students, and if they're watching, they'll probably smile. I mean, they know that they always complain that the professor is not available to review their work, but part of part of the review has to do with the quality of the work that's being delivered, you know, and if there's a lot of spelling errors and table of contents that are not properly formatted and with the right page numbers, you know, I get, um, I, I send work back and then of course everything takes more, more time and it's as if it's my fault. But of course <laughs> it, has, it has to do more with the lack of implementation of a built-in quality process, which which really we should take more to heart. And yeah, no, for bigger. sure. I, I taught environmental law for 10 years at the University of San Diego. And it's just, and even now in my in my practice, when I have you know folks that are working for me send me something that I get distracted by spelling errors and bad grammar and and then I get frustrated <laughs> and I, yeah, I, yeah, exactly. I can't get the idea I can't get the kernel of the idea that's so important okay. unless they can communicate it yeah and the same is true in building information models and drawings yep. and anything else right so building quality is really an important um, topic an important concept yeah and something that people don't don't think about and except kind of after the fact right it's always QC, which means it has to be rework, and rework is, as you know, one of our big wastes out there. Um, so you've been highly decorated, <laughs> highly <laughs> rewarded. You've been highly recognized. That you got received the Pioneers Award from LCI, which I thought was uh, terrific. I know that just recently at the at PPI, um, mm -hmm. you were awarded uh, their outstanding. Um, I can't remember the name of the award, but every year they can, they find somebody who's doing something really amazing and technical and, achievement award. Yeah. Yeah. I think, it, I, I think you keep receiving like lifetime achievement awards because it's hard to pick out, you know, one specific thing uh, that you've done. Cause I think it's a body of work that's contributed to what we've been doing in the, in the lean world. So as you, as you begin to look back on it, um, because you do have a, a fairly significant history with it, What's uh, what's how do you feel about that? And what are your what are your next steps? Are you just going to continue <laughs> continue on until uh, somehow you you fall into a, a bed of rebar and concrete? <laughs> <laughs> something like that. <laughs> probably, yeah, it's probably something like that. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I I I'm very honored to get the you know to, to have received these awards and to get the recognition i mean it is it is a lifetime of work as you as you mentioned i mean it has to do a lot with the places i have been and the other people i've had a chance to work with of course because that that's what lets us lets us make progress is to put our heads together and together tackle the problem so i've been i've been very fortunate um to have had that opportunity and to continue to have that opportunity um to the state um, the the awards, you know, as they are, though they are, um, I think, very much by the lean community. I'm I'm afraid to say <laughs> that there are still a lot of uphill battles to be fought with the uh, the more traditional project management, construction engineering management um, communities um, that. Um, 
that are slow in changing if 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 they're changing at all. So I think we we have we have a long ways to go to bring these more systematic and science based approaches to to our community at large. Yeah, I, I, you know I've noticed especially here in Canada. So it's been great to to be up here because I get to I get to look at all of these issues in a 33 million person population rather than 330 million. And so I can get very familiar with, you know, lots of people who are acting in the community. And I, I think that the number one issue with people actually accepting a changed paradigm, well, number one, people don't mm -hmm. think of, they, they think of lean as something, well, yeah, we can just kind of do that over here. They don't get the idea that this is a fundamental reinvention of the system and a refocus of how you, of how you actually process the built environment. Uh, I think the thing that gets in the way of it is the construction companies are, they're all doing just fine. And they're doing just fine doing all that old stuff that they've been doing forever. Um, and until I think the owners, until the Sutters stand up and say, well, we're not hiring you to do that. We're only hiring you to do, you know, a more thoughtful, more scientific based approach. We're, we're, we're not, looking to negotiate you with you on a contract budget that is a win or lose for one of us. Mm -hmm. We're looking at trying to figure out what this thing should cost and how long it should take and how we can build it uh, as easily as possible, given the complexity of, of mm -hmm. all the work that we're doing. So I, I agree with you. There's a ton of work out there. If, if you were going to focus uh, the listeners and our our community on three or four things. What are the, is, is there any low hanging fruit or have we snapped up all the low hanging fruit and now we have just, you know, institutional and fundamental um, changes that need to be made? Um, that's a question that was not in the questions that you sent. It's a big before. handful. I, well, it just, it just came to me. Yeah. I, I hardly ever send questions out in advance because it's just, you know, it's conversational. When it comes to me, it's like, whoa. But it, what you just asked is a big question. <laughs> um, I mean, the, the distinction between, you know, low hanging fruit versus, versus other things to do. I think the, the lean mindset is really you know, kind of understanding where you are, where your company is, and then setting out on a journey of continuous improvement. And, you know, in a way, I'll, I'll be a little facetious here, but in a way, it doesn't matter how good the competition is, what you want is to just get better yourself. And obviously, for a company to survive, you somehow have to be better than the competition, or at least equal to the competition in order to be able to right. compete. So um, you have to have certain strong competences, but um, I think embarking on a journey of continuous improvement um, is is really is really the starting place, and um, I think that comes with a lot of humility, right? It comes with understanding that there is a lot of things that you do that maybe not the best things to do, <laughs> and then being systematic, and this applies to me as well, uh, no question. <laughs> Uh, and then embarking sort of on a systematic approach to figure out, okay, of all the things that I shouldn't be doing, you know, what what can I stop doing and how do I go about that? And then at the same time, you know, all the things that I'm doing well, how can I even do them better, right? So that that should take some of everybody's bandwidth, I think, in terms of how we spend our time. And sometimes uh, we, we don't have that bandwidth or we don't want to make it available because we're busy firing um, fighting fires and right. and doing things you know that other people want us to do <laughs> so it, it's sometimes very hard to stop the assembly line yeah so i i think that i mean what that oh, what that says to me is that um all of us need to take the time it, it takes to do a deep reflection on what do we keep doing what do we stop doing and what do we start doing what do we what are we learning that actually is going to help us out there and yet we're so busy at the, the, the cartoon with the the guys with the square wheels <laughs> on the yes. cart and the guy who brings up the wheel and they say well we don't have time to innovate we're working here is is a story that i hear too often you know every week i hear somebody mm -hmm. saying oh yeah we're we're doing the best we can and 
and and and I know that they could do better if they just could stop and look at, at, at the processes that they're using and take some time to evaluate what they're really doing. But it's really hard, right? Because the processes that we're doing are intertwined with other people's processes. And so it's really hard on your own to change anything if, if you right. have to do things for other people. It's people people don't like no as an answer, right? <laughs> and it's and it is very much as you know Greg Howell used to say is you know people in construction and elsewhere have the can do attitude as in yes you know i'll do i'll do what you tell me to do and you know i can do it and let me just go ahead and get it over with <laughs> right and, yeah and that has its problems yeah well and, and people will say well we have projects to deliver right so we don't have time to kind of reinvent this stuff but i i mm -hmm. i do agree with you that you you have to take people where they are so it is kind of company by company and and uh, I think we can just make, uh, you know, share the knowledge, make the knowledge available and, mm -hmm. and they can choose <laughs> yeah. to, to look at it or not. Um, but obviously the, the evidence is, uh, is pretty prodigious in favor of moving towards a certainly a more evidence-based way of understanding how projects get delivered and taking as many assumptions out of things as possible, because I think, uh, this is one industry where everything is based on assumptions. Mm -hmm. And the fewer assumptions we have, that's what I love about the IPD agreement, is mm -hmm. that you you get all of the people who are going to be involved in the project on board, and that, that has to lower some of the level of assumptions <laughs> that yeah. you're making. It's got to be a, you know, it's got to be a, a mitigation of some of the risk. I, I like you bringing up the word evidence-based. You know, evidence-based management and the like. I think that's that's very much where we need to move. Is is more data collection, right? Which now is enabled with so many of the IoT devices that we can implement. Um, and then, in addition to data, of course, we need to advance the the type of models that we develop, and so that we can really inform and our our understanding and make better decisions as we go along. Yeah, I've always thought it would be really great to have a a national database of priced icons that you could bring six feet of a three eighths inch conduit into your drawing and it comes with a price and it comes with a, it comes with a, 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 a labor burden, basically a kind of factor of a, <laughs> of a labor burden so that you could begin to accumulate things. I'm, I'm working on a Lego game that is uh, where you have to actually buy the Legos and uh -huh. they, the, the price of them goes up and down and they're, and they all come with a labor burden. And if you buy 17 of one, then your labor burden goes down by 15% because now you're doing repetitive work. And um, it's, it's, so far, it's just too complicated. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, and you, 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 you highlighted the complication, right? It's that you, you really have to do product and process design together. It's about the parts to be put in place, but it's also about how are you going to put these parts in place? And as one changes, the other changes, and there are many possibilities. So it's it's a really tough problem to design the system for for best performance. Yeah, it really is. It it really is at, at the heart. It's systems thinking. It's not necessarily mm -hmm. designed for manufacture or prefab or whatever. It's it's all of that stuff, right? Yeah, exactly, so exactly. And, and there are some good starting points, you know, for systems thinking in terms of, you know, managing inventories and, and managing, um, you know, constraining the working process and so forth. I mean, there is already a good scientific basis to to deploy as a starting point. But we yeah, have you, more to learn. You just have to you just have to dive in and take advantage of it. I'm always surprised by construction companies that do these deep estimates before they start a job. But they never go back with the data that they've actually collected to buff up their estimation system based on what really happened. They just keep going as if as if that data doesn't matter to them. And and there too, right? The data, the data. I mean, maybe they don't use it because it's inadequate for future use. I mean, you want to tie the data back to not just what was the the piece rate for installation, but what methods did we use and what was the context in which we actually did the work? Because that of course will affect how effective people can can uh, can work. Absolutely. Did, did we use tact planning? Did we not use tact planning? Just to give you an example, I think it has a huge impact on how the work can get done. Uh, for sure. 
All right. So, so what's next for you? You just going to continue to plow on until, like I said, you fall into concrete and rebar and, <laughs> and they cover or, you up? Or, or maybe get hit by a robot. Hopefully not. But I'm, very, <laughs> <laughs> I'm very much into industrialized construction. So I'm, I, I have oh, always cool. enjoyed, always enjoyed uh, going to fabrication shops. I take my students to fabrication shops, look at what's happening offsite. I think there's there's a lot of opportunities, possibilities there um, to do things differently, right? To not just take work from on-site and do it the same way off-site, but to really rethink how it is done off-site. And robots automation, of course, provide huge opportunities, although unfortunately also, you know, people might be uh, enticed to invest in technologies that they don't not quite know how to use or that they don't that they don't use as well as they as they can right and i think there's there's huge opportunities there it's a little bit like our our telephones right our cell phones i mean they have they have so many capabilities for example for making pictures but how many of us really know how to know all the adjustments all the settings for pictures as opposed to how many just kind of click and take a picture right. i do that most of the time i just click and take I, a picture i'm in that latter group myself <laughs> um i was i was thinking how cool it was that you know you could leave uh, you could uh, you could work on a floor, you could leave at five o'clock at night, you could take this Hilti machine that puts all your hangers in according to the, mm -hmm. to yeah. the, the model and you show up in the morning and all your hangers are in. Mm -hmm. And then I thought we should be thinking beyond that. We should be thinking about not having hangers. We should be thinking about yeah. how do we get things into buildings without having to, without having to do that. So I, I think that's what you're talking about. How does offsite work actually enhance? Let's just not do offsite what we're doing onsite. Let's do something. That's right. You know, really imaginative. That's so. right. That's right. Well, I appreciate your taking the hour with us. It's time has just flown yeah. by. Yeah. Um, any last words that you want to leave out there? Any words of wisdom? I mean, you're you are the wise one. <laughs> That's a lot of <laughs> well, pressure. <laughs> I I, uh, I mean maybe a quick comment on you know as as having been um, recognized as a pioneer. I, I hope there will be many more people entering our field of lean construction for one thing, but but especially I think it'd be nice to have even more women join our field of lean construction. I think we don't we don't have enough uh, women in the field, and I think lean construction has many, um, at least to me, appealing um, features um, that that um, that make it more attractive to enter the industry than um, you know, than other features of other sectors of our industry, <laughs> to put it mildly. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think I've been fortunate to work with a number of you know, brilliant young women and, and um, you know, back to the students who have graduated, you know, who, are, who are making a change in the industry. And, and I hope there will be many more brilliant young women as well as brilliant young men. But uh, but certainly we need more women so we can we can change the change the balance in the industry. Well, and with your help, we'll introduce the listeners to some of those brilliant women who have been um, really important in in moving things mm -hmm. forward as as you see it. So, mm -hmm. thank you so much for your time. You're obviously the the king woman in our <laughs> in our community. <laughs> um, so thank you so much, Iris. It's been great, and uh, thanks for your service over the over the years. Thank you so much, Dick. It's been, it's been a pleasure and I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you. Thank you for tuning in to the Lean Construction Blogs podcast. If you've enjoyed this episode, please help us spread the word by sharing, subscribing, or leaving a review on your preferred podcast listening platform. Remember to join us next time as we continue to lower the barriers to applying lean construction and help take your lean journey to the next level. And don't forget to visit the Lean Construction blog to stay up to date on our latest podcast episodes, weekly blog posts, monthly webinars, and upcoming conferences. We hope to see you on the next episode.